All right, it is 10 o'clock. Uh, again, I want to say welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you to Anita for agreeing to present on this topic. As I was looking back over all of the things and working on some other projects within the client yesterday, I had a renewed excitement about what she is going to talk about. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Anita, if you're ready. I am ready. Okay, cool. A reminder again, if you have questions throughout the presentation, just put them in the chat box. Lorraine and I are both uh, monitoring that. This is being recorded and will be available on YouTube pretty quickly. And I am by pretty quickly, I mean in the next few days. And I will be sending out uh, TLEU certificates probably by the end of next week. That's my, my not even a stretch goal. I'd like to have it done by tomorrow, but we'll, we'll see. So take it away, Anita. Well, good morning, everyone. This is a great day to be involved in a webinar on cataloging, in my opinion. I'm just thrilled to have all of you uh, gathered together and I really uh, encourage you to put comments and questions in the chat because this is a work in progress that started about a year ago out of a need uh, from our library's point of view of a growing collection that was, um, it just kept growing and we were trying to corral it, wrangle it into a submission so that we could find some of our elusive items. So um, they encouraged me to present at the conference and I figured I would put 10 slides together and then show some uh, real life demos and that would be that. But uh, the slide presentation has morphed into a few more uh, than I imagined because I wanted you to be able to see it. And if it was recorded, you could go back and refer to um, the different methods and what it should look like as you just did a uh, simple conjoining of items. So we'll start out with that. Uh, this would not be possible without help from a lot of people and input from a lot of people. And I really appreciated Katie and Gisela coming over and uh, sitting through the presentation uh, and not falling asleep. So here's hoping <clears throat> that we share some pertinent information for you today. This is me and I've been in library work uh, earlier than this, but our library started with Evergreen in 2009. And I've been working on the circulation desk at the adult reference desk and now in cataloging um, for many, for, for, for that number of years. The features in Evergreen, uh, our first director was Jenny Draper, and she was absolutely thrilled when she came back from her conference because of what this would mean for our patrons. So our library has really tried to grasp that since the beginning that it puts so much power in the patrons hands that they could uh, maintain a history was really big. They could place their own, their own holds. Um, the searches would search all of the libraries that were with Evergreen. And they could see maybe they wanted to drive uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes to pick up an item. And they could see if it was available in the catalog right away. She just absolutely loved that. And we've tried to maintain that um, verb to put the power back in the patron's hands. So this is my experience then since 2009. Um, we, we like buckets here. When we create an item, it automatically goes into a bucket because that's how we print. So even things that we're not printing, I use buckets a lot, but this is what has been happening with buckets through the years. Uh, so uh, absolutely what we cover today will change, whether it's uh, the process for conjoining or the need, even the need to conjoin. Uh, it's possible that Evergreen will develop a very smooth transition to fill our need for grouping items together. The slides will be out of date with the next upgrade at the end of November. Uh, but until then, this process might spark some ideas for helping you wrangle your collection at your library. 
So my plan for this presentation, and this is just kind of an outline of what my plan is, uh, will take a few minutes to demonstrate the current process for how to conjoin items in Evergreen. Then we'll take 10 to 15 minutes discussing the process that led to this new application of the feature. Uh, learning the process should answer a lot of your questions today uh, as you work through this process too. And then after we cover the way to make that application work in the catalog, we'll talk about a few ways our patrons, staff, and the actual collection have benefited from this process. If it, if it hadn't really benefited us, I would not have pursued this or even tried to present it. I would imagine that you'll start thinking of ways to conjoin items in your own collection and any talking after that would just be pointless. So we might as well just get started. Just like in Google Maps, the very beginning, you have to tell Google where you want to go. So when you start conjoining, it wants to know where your destination is. So a uh, little history on going through our genealogy room. <clears throat> we found a book all by itself. And it had a uh, reference right in the frontispiece that there was a map associated with this index of the, because it was the original historical map of landowners in Noble County, but the actual map was located in the Noble County Library. And I thought, well, I, we need to make sure that people know that there are indexes in various locations. And when I did a search for the map, it found, I found out that Plainfield actually had one. So I conjoined our index to the Plainfield map because in a search for the map, people might just be thrilled to find out that there's actually an index for this map. And they probably would not go looking for an index. So the more common item here is going to be the book. And so I'm going to pick a book in our collection that also has an index, which is not the same size as the book. So it often gets um, placed in a different location. We have many um, volumes of this um, history of Orange Township and their little booklet leaflet size, uh, future copies of it, they included portions of the index, but the actual index book is a full page size and thin and um, my, now when my mother did genealogy, she wanted, she always wanted to go back to the original. So, because she thought it's possible that in the retyping it would be changed. And so we would like to be able to prove that there is actually an index to show where the index is and patrons would know that they could come to our library and see the index. So here's a screenshot of the history of the Orange Township book uh, by the Blue Arrow. And this is, we're gonna perform a simple conjoining of items so that you know the process to link one thing to another. If you pull up the book record, you pulled up the mark record for this book, you will actually need to be conjoining an item to the mark record. So you're not going to choose an item with the barcode at this step. You're going to choose the volume and the mark record that best describes the item that you would like to link to. And usually this is going to be the more popular item. They want to find a history of Orange Township. So you can mark in the features, your actions for this record, mark this for conjoined items. Um, I should be able to zoom in over there. You'll notice that also currently the conjoined item that it's gonna to mark to is not this record. So it's best to frequently check this, that the item that you have marked, uh, right after it says conjoined items, it says currently it's the database number. So over there in the green box, that will change when I choose that conjoined items feature. I hope that's clear. So then we're going to go on to finding the index. I'm going to pull up the index in the OPAC. And this is the item that I want to link. This will be a barcode. So I'm going to click on the item, the 
the, the actual index by Lottie Gore. And then a right click or the actions uh, menu will allow you to link as, a conjo as conjoined to the previously marked bib record. So I'll get out of that zoom. That gives you these choices for your peer type. And they're not very robust at this time, but uh, as we use it more and more, Evergreen usually follows suit and sees that this is a popular item and makes it a little more useful for us. So these are your choices. Are you going to link this item? Is it a bound volume, a bilingual uh, item? Is it back to back? Maybe you've got two books back to back. I couldn't find any of those examples to share with you. Is it a set? Uh, some people have Kindles that are loaded with multiple books. Uh, so they've given you that option or is it a kit? So I've, chose, uh, I've chosen bound volume. And now this is what the OPAC will look like after a refresh, the book shows one conjoined item. And I'm talking about this uh, tab next to the holdings view. Your conjoined, I, I'm not the, not the OPAC, I'm sorry. This is the conjoined items in um, your holdings view. And it's listing the Lottie Gore index as conjoined to that. Up above the picture, that you'll see for the index is blank because you haven't linked anything to the index book. You have linked the index book to the book. So uh, in the OPAC then, let's get out of Zoom. This is what you see if you did a search again for the history of Orange Township, it will show you that there is a foreign item at the Kendallville main branch and it is a bound volume History of Orange Township, and that's the index by Lottie Gore. And all of our other items are still going to be shown, all of the, uh, the multiple copies that we have of that. The um, other option, this is very simple to change back and forth. If you, if you accidentally clicked a peer type of book and you meant a kit or kit and you meant a book, this is how you can change that over. While you're, while you're back in your conjoined items um, screen, you can click on the item that you want to change, go up to the peer type, choose something else, click OK, and it will give you this screen then. It will change that over from a bound volume to a kit, just that simply by changing the type Last thing then is in the OPAC, your view of that has changed from a bound volume to a kit. That is the process of conjoining one item to another. Choose something that, is, that the patrons are gonna search for. And if you think you have something that you would like them to also see with that, then you can link that as a conjoined item. Is that fairly clear? Do we have a grasp of conjoining items now? Because that was the simple part. They're already asleep. Well, of course, Jocelyn knows how to do this. <laughs> Nobody is sleeping. We're just excited for the next part. <laughs> oh, you already know how to do this part. You want to move on. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. So here is an application. Our collections seem to get larger and larger, just like when you were a kid with your first camera and you started taking photographs. I could have filled volumes with cat pictures because I could just slip that little cartridge in my Kodak Instamatic and uh, then I would get two copies of everything and uh, they would come back from the pharmacy. And so now I've got all of these pictures and it's just growing and growing and growing. Now I've got two or three packages of them. Then they started allowing duplicate copies of pictures. The problem was then how do I keep track of the pictures? How do I find one particular picture? Because my collection is just compounding. Uh, maybe it's a family reunion and we got multiple copies of that. Maybe, maybe the, the family here is not a family and it's people that are gathered outside the restaurant. Uh, 
they were waiting in line. And somebody said, let me take your picture. I had to shoot the frogs there. I thought that was really, I mean, include the frogs. I thought that was cute. How long did that photographer wait for that? So we're going to move on to how do I create a link so that the patrons could actually find one thing in a bazillion choices of things. And this is how it got started. About a year ago, I walked past the adult reference desk and behind her desk on a shelf, forlorn looking, are these multiple bags of books. And I said, what, what do we have here? And she said, these are all book club kits that came back damaged. Oh, book club kits. And I go way, way back. You, and you may have already handled book club kits differently. And where have you been? I would love for you to have done a presentation on that. Uh, you have may, may have decided not even to have book club kits. Remember that this part, I'm just describing our process to change the way we were dealing with these issues. So stay with me for the grand finale. Don't, don't leave me yet. I just started wondering if they could be handled differently. And I've, I've gone through this scenario many times, even since I worked at the adult desk, because you've got all of these books. And if two of them don't come back with that kit, then the entire kit is broken. And the age that did come back can't circulate. Um, Evergreen has morphed. We can scan barcodes now. We're not handwriting each one. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem to scan multiple books going to a patron. Uh, and they, now you can have the patrons can uh, place multiple holds for those titles. And why not just put them on a regular book record, whatever you checked out or you checked in. Uh, you'd get a circulation for that too. And so I've, I've, I've noodled around on that for quite a while. All right, what's the question from Amanda? Linking only within the library. Oh, oh, I worked for Plainfield. Evergreen may take that option away of linking with another library, but it allowed me to link. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think now which way it went. If I linked to Plainfield or, or I'd have to look that up. So I think reports will probably be needed in the future as we can join more and more items. So Amanda, I don't have the perfect answer for that. Well, this is the thing. We are linking to a MARC record. So the MARC records are public. The MARC record is out there. It's not unkosher. You guys are in some other language in the chat. All right. So here was the big reveal for me. Treating the book club items uh, with the existing mark record because the existing mark record is completely um, accurate in describing the item, the book that the people want. They can certainly find it. Um, maybe the only reason you put it in the kit was because you were going to include uh, questions or you know, discussion group questions, and they can find that online, or maybe they wanted it in a bag. They can contact our adult reference desk and they would be uh, delighted to put things into a bag and ship them to you. But being able to get a credit, a circulation credit for each item coming and going uh, was really gonna be beneficial. So I tried it. I said, all right, what's, what's the worst that can happen? I'm gonna take one of these kits and I'm just gonna put them on the regular mark record. And I'm sure most of you are already ahead of me. This was an oops. I just made our book club books invisible because I took them out of a book club mark record. And it's a total blank then for the patron if they're searching the title, they don't see that we have a book club kit for that. And if I put all 15 books on the fiction shelf, and somebody placed a hold for those, the circulation person pulling the holds would not be happy. They, they're walking up to the shelving and they're seeing 30 books that have the same spine label and they're looking for one particular barcode to fulfill a hold. So I stood there thinking about that and I thought, oh, you know, that um, last upgrade, Evergreen was talking about a carousel 
And so in, in viewing that in my mind, I thought I really wish that our patrons could see moving across the screen, all of our choices of book club kits. And that was the spark that I needed. So we had little light bulbs to hand out to all of you if we were at the Evergreen Convention, because this was a big solution for me was generating a mark record that was a generic mark record for book clubs. Then if a patron put in the search for book clubs, of course you get about 7,900 choices on book clubs, but um, if they were able to say Kendallville book club shelf, then they could see the 50 or 60 book club kits that Kendallville has. And nobody in the library would have to remember every book that we have made a kit out of because that was getting impossible. And if we included a book number in the bottom of the call number, that would distinguish that from all of the others, book one, book two, book 30. And we could also add the author and title in the 505. However, before I got into the conjoining, I noticed that just adding the author and the title in the 505 field, although that will provide search results, it doesn't give them a link to put it on hold. It gives, it, it gives them our shelf of book club kits. So we're gonna have some examples of that shortly, but the master stroke happened when I thought, ah, if we can join the holding to the actual book onto the virtual shelf, that provided an alphabetical listing of all of our book club titles. And I'm telling you, that was huge. It automatically put those things in alphabetical order, although the A's are, uh, it, it, it's kind of funky how it does that too. And the, the thes are under T's, so you have to look a little bit. But it also then provided a link to get to the book and place the hold. That's what I wanted. I wanted the book club kits to show up. I wanted the book to show up. And I wanted the patrons to have a link to be able to place their own hold. Question. No, no, you, you are Repeat putting, the when they, when they put a hold on an item, the item is attached to the barcode. So the barcode is what the staff have to retrieve and check in. And then that is the item that will go. So we've taken a barcode off of a kit of 10 books, and they're actually going to request one um, item that so they're going to get a barcode filled uh, to answer that whole question. All right, so we're going to move on past the master stroke. The next problem was now we're just basically putting this, we're having to describe this idea by a mark record. And you know, I don't do the best original mark records anyway. But uh, if there was something generic, and I think the catalog committee is pondering uh, coming up with a stub record that we could fill for this. Then we could create some actual and some virtual shelves. We do actually have a location for our book club shelves. So patrons just loved that. As soon as we got those things out of the bags, put them on the shelves, they were swarming. Oh, can we take two of these? Oh, you know, I have three ladies I'd like to visit. Uh, over a book with, we have a chat. So uh, we also then have virtual shelves where there's not one location, let's say, for all of the project lit books. Project lit books could be an adult, they could be in teen, they could be in kid. Um, same goes for the Caldecott books. Uh, I'm working on a Caldecott shelf, trying to list the Caldecott winners because they might be in uh, graphic novels, they could be in teen, they could be in kid picture books. Um, they're not all in one location. You can't just point the uh, patron to one location and say, there are all of our young Hoosier. There are all of our uh, local authors. No, our local authors are scattered all over the library. So the next thing was uh, creating the mark that gives us that initial link, just like we needed the initial mark record link for the Orange Township book, then we would have the mark for conjoined items 
that we could link to. And then I put some kind of a holding, uh, some kind of descriptive holding for the uh, call number, and then we could attach those two things. Here's the connection. We're getting ready for screenshots now. We're going to add, uh, show you add a, adding a virtual holding to one of the book club title records. We're going to conjoin that to the shelf. And we just yeah. happen to put an asterisk at the top of our holding so that um, it'll stay up at the top. And that generic thing is what we're going to link to the um, descriptive shelf. Because if we just chose a book and it got damaged, then that might hurt the link in the future. So Anita, before you go into the technicalities of right. that, um, we have a couple questions. All right. Uh, from Sarah, was the change from kits to conjoined items confusing to patrons who were used to getting a hold for a full kit? And now if they wanted all the books, they need to place eight holds. Well, I think that the main thing that happened was Evergreen saying they could place multiple holds. And so we saw a lot of book club requests being filled by uh, multiple libraries. We would get several books from uh, many locations to fill patron requests for a book club. So uh, if they find out that we have eight um, or 10, they can contact us to pull all eight of ours, or they're just gonna put a hold in Evergreen for eight books or 10 titles, you know, 10 of the same thing sure. and hold from any library. But that was one of the issues that Leah said, if I've got eight back and none of them can circulate because the kit is broken and damaged, you know, it's damaged, uh, there's something wrong with this process. So uh, th this is just a, a solution that, um, that helped us and it, it certainly took us into a, a new direction for the library of things. So you didn't, you didn't really find that your patrons expressed that they were confused by those things they didn't have a problem with that and they really liked the fact that they could uh they could request seven right uh, we had more people that would say well i don't want all 10 i only have five people sure well and then if leah pulls out five and she gets back two and she replaces them with paperbacks instead of hardbacks then i mean it just you don't have to update the whole it was the, really the weird. yeah yeah it, I mean, this has been, yeah, talk to me about book club kits. This is, yeah. and, and maybe you, if you've got other solutions, we would love to hear them. There are myriad solutions, whatever works for your library. And then Katie has a question. Uh, my new children's librarian was asking about a way to search the catalog for our holiday books or fall books. Could I conjoin our fall picture books to a virtual shelf? I just love this question. That is precisely the point. Dream on, dream on big about that because I wanted, I really wanted to be able to quickly create a shelf that books could be quickly put on and taken off. So the process of linking and unlinking could not be simpler at this time until Evergreen might make a change. I don't know. But it will also, I think, move us toward this whole carousel feature of adding these items that I just like to make a quick list. Uh, and Beth has done that in the children's department. She's created a hundred books before middle school. Well, they've got a wonderful pamphlet for, you know, check off uh, the books until you get to, uh, to 200. We don't have all 200 on the shelf, but maybe we've got 15 to 20 that they can choose from. And then they can look for other books on, in that pamphlet or just the goal of reading 200 books. Then she did 100 books before high school. So linking a few books and titles that we have, and I did not link to other books and other libraries because there are other libraries that have these books. I just, I just chose to link and conjoin our own to particular shelves. So a dream big on making a list setting it up quickly that can change for summer reading projects, uh, staff picks, uh, et cetera. I hope that answers that question, Katie. Thanks for that. Uh, and, and then I will say too, a couple of things that Anita have, has brought up that somehow may supersede this, um, being carousels and then improve functionality of lists. They're not going to replace this from what I have seen 
Um, while those can be used in some similar ways and will be used and carousels will be available uh, with the upgrade, this does provide some other functionality and some flexibility that may continue into some unforeseen future to be more appropriate for your needs. So uh, the carousels are an OPAC enhancement. So they, they'll be on the OPAC for both Evergreen Indiana and then for your local uh, OPAC. And then I'll let Anita talk about the display of the virtual shelf. All right, appreciate that uh, input, Ruth, and appreciate the questions. Amanda, the, um, the closest we've come to promoting these on the website is like the link that Ruth sent out yesterday so that patrons can see on the website a link that takes them to the OPAC. And the virtual shelf is described, described, not displayed, it's described on uh, or in a mark record that they can find when they type in Kendallville shelf. Um, it, it, it was my hope that after I typed in all of the titles for Project Lit, let's say, for the different years, other libraries might be able to copy and paste that total list of uh, Project Lit improve on that if I missed anything, and then they could put that in their own mark record for a North Webster shelf, let's say. Um, that, I, I would like to see it grow. If it does, if we, if we really like this, maybe Evergreen will create something for us uh, specifically for virtual shelves, because if you go to one of the other libraries databases like Seattle, um, Kent District, um, Lists are no problem for them. Uh, they can create lists and you can, you can type in something and it will tell you how many lists this is also on. Uh, so it's possible that it will morph into some other uh, look or appearance in the OPEC in the future. But uh, this, is what we, this is what we came up with for our solutions for our needs uh, within the last year. Uh, let's proceed to an OPAC view. And I know this is really tiny, but I really didn't want you guys examining it anyway. Uh, this is our book club shelf. This is our listing of titles and authors so that any kind of an OPAC search, they would be able to see it linked to the Kendallville book club shelf. This is our call number. Uh, over on the right-hand side, I can mark this for conjoined items. Um, notice there, the number right now is something different, the database ID. Uh, so I need to click this, this book club shelf for the conjoined items. And then I'm going to go out there and search for our book club kits that I want to bring on board. I want to link all of these things to our book club shelf. So up at the top, our very first, because I put an asterisk in front of it, is the descriptor. We're going to link this virtual holding to the book club shelf so that the book club shelf OPAC view will uh, show an alphabetical listing of all of our titles. This is a fair warning. If you are creating a virtual item or a virtual shelf, do not make it holdable. If you don't want a patron putting a request out there for your book club shelf and seeing that appear in your holds list, make sure it is not holdable. I don't care that much about the circulate yes or no. There, there's no, this barcode is not in, um, it's not going to show up anywhere. So they can't walk up to the desk with the barcode and say, I want to check out this shelf. But make sure that the virtual items are not holdable. So this is what an OPEC search looks like for the Kendallville book club shelf. Um, I don't, yeah, the youth services have about 55 at any given time and the adults have, uh, they've got about 70 now. And then if you click on that, you're gonna see this list down here and here's the second page or whatever. So clicking on one of these links, I love that. They can click on the link and that's gonna take them 
to be able to put a hold on uh, any number of books that they want out of that uh, particular title. So that is then the conjoined items view. We went across these tabs for the OPEC view, the MARC view, the holdings view. Here's the conjoined items tab. And this is where you could change if these things are a kit or if they are a bound volume. Uh, you can link and unlink. On the left-hand side, you can change the type, anything that you click in these boxes. You, can, uh, you have very few actions that you can take. Those are your three. You can change the type, you can unlink and refresh the page. This is not a robust, um, uh, I can't think, the columns are not robust here because this is very limited, the actions that you can take for uh, the actual items. I'm reading the question. You just reiterating. Yeah, it was just a comment. All right, now let's reverse that. That was a patron looking for a book club kit. This is a patron that does a search for 50 words for rain. They typed in 50 words for rain, Lemmy as a keyword, and all over Evergreen, and this is what they will see in the OPAC. Uh, okay, there are about 58 copies. Kendallville has 10, or has 13, 10 are available. Uh, oh, there's a book page shelf, and that's on that. Oh, there's a book club shelf, and it's on that. So they have a couple of options right there just by the basic search of 50 words for rain. This is the uh, view then, after they click on it, your choices are the book club shelf or an actual item. And so the red arrow will show you that the shelf, not holdable, and each one of the items then, books one through 10, are uh, there's a link right there, to, you can place holds, you can place item holds, um, and they'll have, their choices are right there. I love that link. I loved conjoining that so that they could see the total list of everything. Our holdings view of this book looks like this because we do have some that are not included in the book club and they will be on the fiction shelves here and at our branch. All right, when we hit that and when we saw that alphabetical list, we the light bulbs went off everywhere. We just thought, man, oh man, we've got so many lists that we would like for people to be able to see. And then how about the staff? How about the staff that have been trying to keep track of all of the uh, different types of cake pans, all of the different types of musical instruments in the library of things? Uh, we have a lot of like kinds that we would like for them to be able to find. And this is what we're limited to right now. To do a search in the OPAC, you can search for the title. Well, yeah, it was a disc game. It was Frisbee. It was an outdoor game. It was a golf, maybe it was a soccer. They can't remember the actual title of the yard game. There is no author. And what keyword search is going to be very effective for uh, the hunt for the item that they had and they'd like to find again? Or what do you have will often be the question from the patrons. So here is your, this I hope sparks your interest in what kind of groupings are you trying to maintain in your library? A simple uh, virtual shelf might direct people to a lot of other choices that they didn't even know your library had. So if you could create some generic mark records for describing uh, the project lit books, the Elliot Rosewater things, uh, young Hoosier books, they're, they're just out of control in our library. We've got, we've got to wrangle these things. Um, we keep all of our on order books on a list so that people can find that. And then they move after they're here, then they're no longer on the on order list. Uh, they're, they're no longer coming soon, they're here. And uh, we're going to have to cover how to handle that too in uh, conjoined items. So this became our problem, how to keep track of these growing collections. Uh, for instance, if somebody came into your library and said, what magazines do you have? You might be able to direct them to a room of magazines. But what if they're at home and they call in? 
here is what you might find in a search on the OPAC. If your staff member types in, I've got it across the top, Kendallville Serials, Kendallville Public Library, let's limit it to that. The format will be for shell, the serials. This is assuming patrons know to choose serials and even limiting it, see this one over here, the uh, location to be adult magazines. Look at these search results. I don't even know where these things are. We don't have them. They're, they're not our library's items, but there are 300 results practically and multiple pages for them to search through while the person is on the phone. And the simple question was, what magazines do you have? This is very frustrating for me because I don't want them to lose confidence in our OPAC searches. I would like for them to actually find something in their first search. So it has been brought up that it might take a while to pull up the Kendallville coming soon shelf. It's going to take a while for that to load. But it takes a long time to have multiple searches before you actually get to something answering the question that you were searching for. And having to type something else in is very frustrating. And wouldn't a patron wonder what went wrong uh, in their search after that result? So if we type, if we look at our uh, magazine, of course, this is a bucket. This is a record bucket for magazines in our collection. We've got, um, I don't know, 130 or something. Uh, we can pull up each one of these that I want to add something to, and it will automatically load that. It's very helpful for us. So we created a magazine shelf, which also included the newspaper titles that we're getting, uh, because maybe somebody at the desk doesn't, maybe they don't know what um, newspapers actually come into the library every day. Then this will be what they see if they look at our magazine shelf, they'll see a listing of our magazines. And I've put, I've included in the call number if it's a bi-monthly thing or quarterly or how often they should uh, expect that to come. And on this record, I included the titles so that if they did a search for uh, the yoga journal, they would say, oh boy, there's a shelf of, of uh, magazines I can look at. Um, and it would take them to this um, mark record as well. You don't have to do that to link things, but it's it's beneficial in the search. All right, revolving lists, and I said we needed to cover this before we uh, finish up today. The on order lists, if you put them in a conjoined item so that a patron could browse, pardon me, they could browse what's coming. And when it actually arrives, you need to delete it off of the conjoined items list you're going to need to mark it in some way to be able to recognize it. The mark record, I mean, the conjoint items view does not sort and it does not show you what has been deleted yet. I think it's very possible that Evergreen could add uh, other columns to the conjoined items view in the mark. So in an item bucket, which I also keep our coming soon items, you can see that these have been altered, the ones that have the X's in front of them. I used to do a DEL, but that took both hands at the keyboard. So I just do uh, three X's in front of the barcode. And this is the, uh, it's coming soon. So it's KPL with the ISBN number. So when I want to get that out of the conjoined items view, I need to be able to quickly recognize that. And this is the conjoined items view. And I can see that I need to click on this box in front of 109. This item actually came. I need to get it out of the list. And then I will go up to the top and click the unlink button. And I can do this for multiple things. I could have clicked all three of these and say unlink and then the screen will come up. They will unlink one item. But without the X's, everything would look like this screen. And then I would have to go down through the titles, which are not also not in alphabetical order. And we have over 200, uh, as a general rule, we have over 200 books on this list. So that would, that would take quite a while. But if I go in and I change the barcode, with something, 
save that and then add the actual book when it comes in, uh, I have a way to recognize what needs to be unlinked from the conjoined items. I say this because just like in the item buckets, if you put something in an item bucket, it stays there until you remove it from the item bucket, even if it is deleted from the catalog. So you may have some damaged uh, books that came back uh, and you dumped them in a bucket. Uh, just deleting them from the catalog does not remove them from the bucket. And it's not going to unlink the item either. I do not go back to this conjoined items uh, every time I add a book. I go back to the uh, conjoined items to take these off maybe weekly because I don't care if they reside in the coming soon mark record uh, longer than necessary. Uh, they'll just be there for the patrons to see. But um, after about a week, uh, they're usually cleaned up and taken out of there. So now you know how to link and you know how easy it is to link and how easy it is to unlink. Uh, so now you can view some of the uh, shelves. And looking at the amount of items that we have in these uh, shelves, you can see why we really needed to do something to be able to find one particular item for the patrons to be able to find one particular item. There are 37 pages here. Uh, and I know that's quite a bit, but if you typed in Kendallville Library uh, or Kendallville Lego shelf, it would take you directly to that shelf. And then they would only have to cruise through about 100 items to find the item that they wanted. What about tidy next? How to quickly add multiple items is what we've got next. From this item bucket, uh, now that you are able to uh, request that it show you um, these items in the item status screen, you can click on whatever you'd like to see from your item bucket and then open an item status. It will take you to item status. One of your choices for all of these items in the item status screen is to link as, uh, link, link as conjoined. So uh, that means that I could run a report uh, for a particular uh, list of things and download that file. I could, I could link everything to a particular mark record or I could choose the items that I wanted to link to that mark record. Um, the other thing is at this point, I wouldn't try to do more than 10 or 15 items at a time to link. This will auto populate after you link to the uh, mark record. And so you're going to have multiple listings of, uh, let's say these binge boxes. Every time it repopulates, it's going to put them back in the list again. And that gets very confusing and it will not load more than 25. I've never seen it load more than 25 or link more than 25 things at a time. So now we've talked about uh, conjoining huge lists or multiple things. Let's say you just wanted to do a few items uh, like Katie was asking. You can create a shelf. Uh, you can describe uh, why these things are unique, what makes them a unit. Uh, you can list the titles in the 505 field, uh, list a listing of authors only. Uh, depends on what you're trying to link. And then uh, you have uh, to create the holding market for conjoined items and then go crazy, go link, go start linking books to uh, your shelf. In some cases, I will link both copies that we have. Uh, and if the, like the project lit, let's say, we had quite a few items from the teen collection were on playaways. So I would link the book and the playaway. Or in the adult collection, link the book and the audio. Um, or maybe it's, a, maybe it's a DVD, maybe the book came out in, in movie form. So we've got um, the, uh, we, we put all of our thousand books before kindergarten into shelves too, because that ordered them uh, alphabetically. That was fun. This is the point. Try it. Just go, go conjoin something and see if it works for your library. Uh, whether you have a growing list to maintain or just a small list of favorites you'd like to share with your patrons, 
consider conjoined items for the OPAC. Even if you can't foresee a use now, remember this for the future. Uh, and I really appreciate you listening to me going on and on about this. You know, I could talk about cataloging all day long. I could talk about buckets this long too. This is a great time for your questions if you've got any questions or, or ideas or applications, or if this sparked a, a way that you can uh, think of using this in your library to conjoin items. So I, I appreciate your listening today. Do you have anything that you, anything else that has come up? So I have just a, a clarifying thing um, and then a, a question. Uh, so just clarifying, and this is in answer to another question. If I want to create a list of items to conjoin, uh, do I make a virtual record and then the, uh, conjoin the items to that? And my response to that was yes. That yes. is exactly what you do. The, the follow-up question to that is, should you put each item on the virtual record in a 505? That is, um, that depends to me, that depends on the list. On our coming soon show, no. Yeah, because um, I, I mean, that could just be a, an immense record too, if you were well, doing that. It's revolving. Um, I created a book page shelf um, and I am trying to separate that out for uh, monthly items that are coming out in a book page publication. And so after three or four months, I probably will go in, I will take those off and just delete the uh, titles that are in there. But I've not found it necessary to put the titles of everything uh, I should check and see if Teresa did that in our library of things. I doubt that she listed mm -hmm. uh, everything in the 505. And, and Teresa has just conjoined, found, I mean, we've got over seven, we've got about 700 art prints and art, uh, deck. I mean, deco, home deck things that just are constantly checking out of here. And she recently went through all of those. They're in seasonal uh, topics so patrons can actually look for the item that they want. Looking forward to the adding adding pictures, by the way, to mm -hmm. some of these obscure things. Yeah. So, well, we'll we'll talk about that at another time about adding pictures. That's coming up very soon. Uh, Catherine has a question. If you want to, and, and I think I I actually have the answer to this. If you want to create a circulating kit with multiple items going out as a conjoined kit. If you make the primary record holdable, how does this deal with the circulation? If you check out the barcode on the kit, but each item inside also has its own barcode too. Uh, you get a circulation for each of those things within there. That's part of the conjoining process. So it actually checks out those barcodes uh, as well when you check out the one barcode in the system. It doesn't show up in the patron's record that way, but those items are marked as checked out in the system once the parent record uh, is checked out from that one barcode. Anybody else with any questions? Lots of thank yous in the chat for you. Circulation is, I mean, it's kind of the, the bread and butter of this whole deal. It's all about getting things to circulate, but then how are they tracked in Evergreen and how they affect your circulation statistics as well. I hope that it created a lot of um, need. I think that uh, I, I'd like for us to look at these things in a way that um, would group them better for the patrons to be able to find. And if we are consistently sharing this, uh, this need or this request with the Evergreen community, uh, they could definitely come up with something that might be easier to work with. But uh, if, you're, if your library doesn't have these really large collections starting, this may not be an issue for you, yeah. for you, but it's possible that you would like to create a list in a timely manner, uh, not, not just to display, but things that you feel like the, something has grouped them in your mind. Yeah, like, like putting they're kind of like buckets bucket. for yeah. patrons. I wonder why I thought of that. Yes, yeah. I like 
grouping those things together. So yeah. Uh, and there is there is a question here from Jennifer: Is documentation in the cataloging manual? The answer is yes. There is documentation on how to conjoin items, but all of these use cases, not not necessarily. So it does there which is not really something that would necessarily go into the training manual, which is why we wanted to have Anita present on this. And as it, as we see the need, maybe there can be continuing education on how to do this as well. This is just an application. And I imagine there are plenty of other things uh, that libraries have found useful that we would all benefit from hearing. Absolutely. Uh, different applications that they are using in Evergreen. Anyone else? If not, I want to thank Anita specifically for presenting. This was a really great topic. I'm, I'm really glad that you agreed to present on it from, I know you got a lot of cajoling uh, to do yes. so. And um, so. And I appreciate the comments back from people too. And thank you to everybody who joined us. I will uh, be sending out a follow-up email and this will be available for review on our YouTube training channel in a few days. So I will get back with all of you. If you have questions, you see Anita's uh, contact information there is on the screen and she really does love to talk people through and is a great teacher. And you can always contact me if you need anything else, of course. If there is nothing else, I uh, hope you all have a great day and Thank we'll you, see you at the next. Yeah, of course. Oh, my pleasure. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.